Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Um, we've got some visitors. Um, uh, Paul Dean has just told me that he has invited his uh, Sabbath School class to join us. And most of them are here. In fact, there may be more of his here than there are of our folk. Uh, and your folk come earlier than ours do. Ours will be here in another five or ten minutes. Um, anyway, we're very happy that, um, that we can have um, Dr. Robert Pichon. Pichon. Uh, Dr. Robert Pichon. And uh, he and his wife Joan uh, are here. They uh, have come all the way from Thousand Oaks. Right? And uh, we're, we're glad that they could be here. And they are here because of uh, a class member of ours, uh, Cherry Horn, who's, uh, who has gone to a extension class that uh, Robert has taught there uh, on cosmology and she was very impressed with him and told us about him and it's uh, led to this morning. And we're very happy that, uh, that we can have uh, the Gianni's here today. And uh, what we have asked him to do is to talk about uh, faith and science, something that he usually doesn't do. Uh, he is a uh, he is a physicist. He got his, uh, his PhD from Stanford in high energy physics. Uh, he has been involved in development of some medical technologies, particularly having to do with radiation. He has several patents, uh, but he now is um, spending most of his time uh, talking to groups like this. Uh, if you want to see. His extensive uh, list of sites for presentations that go to his website. Mm -hmm. Last night he was at the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. Yes. Whatever that is. Mm -hmm. but, but he has gone to a number of astronomical societies here in the Southland, plus I think every Rotary Club that exists uh, here in the Southland. <laughs> but we're very happy that he can be here with us to this morning talk about the interface of science and religion. Uh, he um, is a member of the Jewish community, and uh, he will say what he wants to about that, but we're looking forward to uh, this presentation. Then this afternoon, he will be giving his, um, his lecture on uh, cosmology. It will be based on a little book that he has uh, called um, Can Life Be Merely an Accident? Um, and this is a s smaller book based on uh, everyone's guide to Adam's Einstein and universe, isn't it, Robert? Isn't this is a small version of this larger one? Uh, the larger one is all of, is about modern science, so physics, astronomy, and cosmology. And after I finished writing it, uh, it occurred to me that throughout this there are many instances in which the universe had to be just a certain way in order to make life possible. And those coincidences, if you want to call them that, are truly astounding. And so after, when this book was at the printer, and I finally had a chance to think clearly again after obsessing over every comma in this book, I uh, put all that together and I wrote this book, which is a scientific analysis of those probability that all of those things could occur by random chance. <laughs> which has been the theory of science for 50 years. And now that we know much more than we did 50 years ago, the answer is that for well, that to occur by random chance would be the most extraordinary event that one could possibly imagine. It's, in fact, ridiculously improbable. So this is a scientific analysis that demonstrates that. So that's this afternoon's talk. And uh, I've already been asked about uh, how you might purchase uh, material that Robert has, uh, has, has produced, and what we have is the following. If you would like to uh, have one of these books, or more than that, you don't have to give him money now, and what he has done is brought a sheet that you can sign up on, and uh, you'd like to have your contact information like your phone number, and then he will give you an envelope, but John is uh, the master of this logistics, uh, an envelope which will have the amount that you should send them, and so you can send them a check uh, at your convenience. Uh, 
hopefully your convenience uh, comes to play within the next uh, week or two. Uh, anyway, that uh, that's that's the plan, and uh, and so after we get through here, you can uh, come up here and look at these. Uh, like. Okay. Um, the idea is for uh, Dr. Jenny to uh, talk to us for 45 minutes, and then there'll be time. For discussion, we do go up and up through uh, 12:30, and uh, and then we will um, call it a morning. So um, why don't uh, we begin by bowing our heads for prayer? God, thank you for this uh, a Sabbath that we Adventists and we Jews uh, celebrate week by week. We're thankful for the opportunity to come together and to talk about large issues in life, particularly the relationship of our science, which you have given us minds to create, and religion, which we also to a great degree have created because none of us is privy to the ultimate knowledge of the divine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Robert, for being with us. We uh, look forward to what you have to say to us. Thank you. Can you all hear me in the back? Or wave? Thank you. Let me just augment the introduction with one small comment. The, uh, Jim correctly said that I worked on machines uh, that developed radiation. This was not to make a bomb, by the way. <laughs> These are machines that uh, are used for cancer therapy and also CT scans. So they're all medical equipment. They all use particle beams, and that's all high energy physics, so that's the point. Well, I'm very pleased to be here today, and I appreciate the fact that all of you are here investing your time to hear what I have to say about science and religion. And everything I say is going to be from the point of view of a scientist. That's what I am. I'm a card carrying member of the science community. Today, uh, these are the topics that I'd like to cover. I'd like to say a few words about what science really is, and the strengths and weaknesses of science, pluses and minuses. Uh, give you some quotes from the world's most famous scientist, Albert Einstein, on the subject of religion. Then I'd like to talk about how science and faith can be compatible. And I'd like to compare the description of creation as given by the book of Genesis and as given by the best scientific theory that addresses the same question, the bank theory. And I think you'll find a great deal of similarity in those. Then I'd like to talk about something I call the testament of nature. And lastly, there's a new book by Stephen Hawking uh, on the origin of life, the origin of the universe, and he makes comments about God. And I'd like to provide it, my own critique content of that book. So let me just start with the beginning. The question is first, what is science? <clears throat> well, it's the urgent need that I think almost every human being has to answer the question, why? To understand the universe around us, to understand why it works and how it works, and perhaps most importantly, to understand how we, as human beings, fit in the cosmos. And I think this is something that's inherent in all of us, and certainly my grandkids have this tremendous urge to understand the world around them. They constantly are interested in how things work. And I think scientists are just people like that who, when they grew up, never learned to stop asking one. So science is this insatiable curiosity to understand the world around us. So it's society's organized effort to understand nature. And we operate uh, in two modes. One is by the collection of data, by observations and experiments and measurements. And the second is by creating mental models, or if you will, theories, uh, which are interpretations of what those data might mean. The distinction is that the observed measurements, once they're confirmed by multiple groups of scientists, tend to be extraordinarily reliable. One of the most dependable things that a human society can provide is scientific data that has been confirmed. 
by comparison, the models are interpretations of the data, and the models evolve over time. Newton had a wonderful model of gravity, but it turned out to be more precise. Einstein had a more precise model of gravity, which superseded that. Doesn't exactly mean that Newton was wrong, he just wasn't as precise as Einstein. So the models evolve over time and should not be considered sacrosanct, but the data are much more reliable, much higher level of confidence in the data themselves than in the now, Richard Feynman, who was one of the most famous physicists of the 20th century, Nobel Prize winner, and one of my professors at Caltech, and a good friend of my dad, said that the basis of science is its ability to predict. So this is perhaps our main goal. We strive to develop these models of the universe that allow us to make useful predictions. The predictions hopefully will avoid, help society avoid hazards, help society benefit from opportunities, and help all of us modify nature in a way that benefits us. Now let's talk about the models or the so-called theories. Theory is a word that is used differently in uh, common English parlance than it is in science, and it's a word that's been abused uh, by everyone, including by scientists. And so scientists are sort of moving away from the word theory and moving more toward the word model, which recognizes the sort of uh, temporary nature of these things. So models are our interpretations of what our measurements mean. And we never prove a model or a theory, unlike mathematics. So in mathematics, Euclid proved 25 centuries ago that the sum of the angles of any triangle add up to 180 degrees. That only needs to be proved once, and it's proved for all eternity. But Euclid, nor any other mathematician, can prove that that has anything to do with the real world. It's a theorem about ideal triangles. The question of whether or not that pertains to our universe is a scientific question and can only be resolved by measurement. And in fact, if you draw a triangle on the surface of the Earth, it will never have a any triangle that you would draw in the entire universe would not have 180 degrees. So models are not proven by science, but they are what we would call validated by the data. And they're validated as being effective, not true, but effective, and effective only within the range of circumstances in which they're tested and to the specific level of precision that those data provide. Scientists can never measure anything to absolute precision. There's always a limitation to the quality of our instruments, and so there's a limitation to the level of precision that any scientific data is known. We spend at least as much time deciding what the level of precision is as we do deciding what the actual measurement itself is. And knowing how well you know something is one of the hallmarks of science. Let me uh, give you a couple examples of this. There are two theories of uh, physics which are the golden pillars of 20th century science, quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of special relativity. This is the validation of the, of the model of quantum mechanics. There is a certain parameter, it doesn't really matter what it is, but we can measure that parameter to 12 decimal digits, and to 12 decimal digits, it exactly matches the theory of quantum mechanics. So we know to this precision, to one part in a trillion, that quantum mechanics is an effective model of the universe. That's pretty impressive. Next year, someone may measure the 13th digit. If they do, it may or may not confirm quantum mechanics. If it doesn't, we'll, we will look for a better model. This theory of special relativity, Einstein's theory, has the assumption, the principal assumption that the speed of light is always the same number, a number we call C, and this has been extensively tested and it is confirmed to 18 decimal digits, one part in a billionth of a billion. So again, 
our models have become extremely effective, extremely uh, predictive of what nature actually does. But if someone measures the 19th digit and finds it's different than Einstein predicted, then we'll need a new theory. And that person will get a full professorship at Harvard and a Nobel Prize. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the sociology of scientists. First of all, we have no prophets in science. There is no authority that scientists look to as absolute, uh, as providing an absolute truth. Even Einstein, the most famous scientist in the world, was wrong about half the time. We consider that spectacularly successful for a theoretical physicist to be right half the time. Just like a baseball player who had a batting average of 500 would be the league MVP. If you try to work on things which are completely unknown and half of your guesses are right, that is tremendous success. The other scientists are there to correct the ones that are wrong. Secondly, scientists, science is not a democracy. There's no voting. Nature has the one and only vote. If 100% of the scientists in the world believe a certain thing, and we do an experiment and we find nature does something else, then the only thing that matters is what nature said. Secondly, scientists are not all that friendly. They are far more competitive than they are collegial, and the best path to success in science is to prove other people wrong. So there is no greater, way, uh, faster way to success in science than <coughs> the most common, uh, models of science to be incorrect, such as relativity and quantum mechanics. So people try to disprove these theories every day. These theories have literally been tested 10 or 20 or 50,000 times in the last century. And every effort is made uh, diligently by scientists to disprove these theories, both to advance the field and to, for personal gain. So what is it that science does well, and what does science do not so well? Well, science has made, I believe, a tremendous contribution to society. And to demonstrate that, I'd like to describe this country to you and then ask each of you to think about what this country might be. So this, in this country, the average life expectancy is 47 years. The average worker makes $300 per year. 8% of the homes only have a telephone. And if you use your telephone and you call across the country, it will cost you two days' salary. 14% of the homes have a bathtub. And within this country, there are only 144 miles of paved roads. Only 6% of the adults have graduated from high school, and 90% of the doctors in this country never attended even a single day of college. So how many people think this is a country in Africa? <coughs> Asia, South America, North America, You've all heard this joke before. <laughs> Who wants to give me the answer? What? It's an hour and a half. This is the United States of America in the year 1904, <laughs> about 100 years ago. So clearly we have made substantial progress. I mean, I would argue that Coca-Cola is a cultural achievement. Many things that we do in our society aren't really all that worthwhile. But we have made enormous contributions, uh, advances in many fields that I think all of us could agree are very important. And economists analyzing this have determined that about 75% of the advance in the United States in the last century in terms of increased uh, life expectancy and health and uh, wealth, 75% of that advance is due to science and technology, better ways of doing things. And 25%, the remainder, is due to the fact that, uh, of capital investment. So if a farmer takes some of his profits and he invests in the second mule, that's capital investment. Next year, he can raise more crops for the second mule. On the other hand, if someone invents a tractor, then the farmer can develop much larger uh, harvests. 
So that's the good side of science. That's what science is good at. Science is best at answering questions where the answers are numbers. So science is particularly strong if you ask a question like, how far away is the sun? How old is the earth? How old is the universe? The answer to all those are numbers, and that's what science is here for. Coming up with numerical answers to questions that are very tangible. On the other hand, and let me give you a couple of examples. This is a picture of a supernova. The star that exploded as a supernova is right in the center. And like all stars coming to the end of their lives, they cast off some of their outer layers before the final phase of uh, explosion. And so you see these rings around the central star. This supernova was observed on Earth in the year 1987. And the interesting thing about this is that 245 days after we observed the supernova in the center, we observed this inner ring brighten up dramatically. Okay? 245 days after the explosion, that inner ring lit up like a Christmas tree. And so what that means is that that ring around the supernova was hit by the blast energy of the supernova 245 days after the blast. That tells us how big the ring is. The size of this ring is 245 times the number of miles that light moves in a day. That tells us the side of this triangle. And we can measure the angle in the sky from one side of the ring to the other. That's the angle. And by simple trigonometry, we can tell you this distance, right? If you know the side of a triangle and the angle, you can calculate the distance. And that tells the distance is 168,000 light years. A light year is six trillion miles, so that is a million, million, million miles away. The brightest supernova ever seen in the last 400 years, by the way. Well, what does that tell us? A number of things. It tells you, uh, among other things, that the universe has to be at least 160,000 years old. It's a direct measurement that if this is 245 days, this is 168,000 years. So that event actually occurred 168,000 years ago. And that's how long it took the light from this supernova. It doesn't depend, this answer does not depend on the speed of light. It only depends on the so it is a very simple measure. Now let's talk about where science is very weak or, in fact, irrelevant. Science cannot even begin to address a number of vital questions to society, such as what is love, beauty, or how, or sorry, why was the universe created? What is the purpose of human life? What are the principles that a decent person should live by? And does God exist or not? If God does exist, which God is it that exists? None of these questions are in the purview of science, and it is certainly impossible for science to even begin to address any of these. These are simply not quantitative in the realm of scientific experiment. Let's compare uh, some of, let's look at some of Einstein's quotes on science. He said there are only two ways to live your life. One is as if nothing is a miracle, the other is if everything is perfect. He was in the second camp. He also said science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. I'm not saying that any of us have to agree with all of these, but it's interesting to understand what he thought. He also said that all religions, arts, and sciences are branches of the same tree, branches of the same human effort to understand our connection to enhance our spiritual being. Uh, science, uh, Einstein also said that his purpose in life was not to solve some equation, but his purpose in life was to understand God's thoughts. And all the rest, including all the equations, were just simply to make details. He said his religion consisted of the humble admiration of the inimitable superior spirit 
reveals himself in the slightest details we are able to perceive with our fail and feeble minds. And finally, he said, true religion is real living, living with all one's soul, with all one's goodness and righteousness. <coughs> so he was definitely a person that believed in God, as did Newton, and as do approximately half of scientists today, according to the Los Angeles Times report. So in my view, science and faith are both, when practiced in their best, sincere efforts to find truth. And truth is something that all of us should value. None of us get to decide what the truth is. All we do is hopefully get to discover some of it. And I make the comparison between science and faith with our vision. We have binocular vision. Uh, this would have not so nicely. But these, this is uh, a human head here with two eyes. And our vision works better. We see better because we have two eyes. And each eye views the world from a slightly different perspective. And in that sense, this could be viewed as the relationship between science and faith. They both are sincere efforts to search for truth the fact that we have these two ways of searching from slightly different perspectives should enable people of good will to uh, do a better job in searching the truth. That's the uh, way in which science and faith can be developed. Now, let me do this comparison of the book of Genesis and the theory of the Big Bang. I think you'll find this amusing. They both start out with the statement that the universe began at a certain point in time, that the universe has not always existed. And that is a fundamental uh, point of view. So before the universe began, they both say there was nothing. The book of Genesis says God created the universe in an instant, and the theory of the Big Bang says the universe began, doesn't say how, also in an instant. The theory of the Big Bang provides no insight into why the universe was created. It's just simply not addressed. Genesis says, let there be light. And the theory of the Big Bang says, the first thing that happened was there was energy. That's what light is. And there was also space and time. After that, Genesis tells us that uh, God created the heavenly firmament and the dry land, which is called Earth. And the uh, Big Bang said, after the initial uh, creation, there developed stars and planets. Both say that thereafter came the uh, origin of life, and finally the origin of humanity. So, so far we have a nearly perfect match, which is really astonishing, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, here we have very, two very different schools of thought that have converged on almost identically the same description of the origin of the universe and the origin of life. And then finally, we have a number. The book of Genesis says all of this creation occurred within six days. The theory of the Big Bang says this took a few billion years. Well, I think it's clear that six days and billions of years are actually different numbers. <laughs> but I would say the number is not the most important thing on the page. The most important thing on the page is the message of creation. And even though six days and billions of years are very different, I would not suggest to you that you change the name of your faith to the billions of years of it. <laughs> I don't think that's the most important part of this message. So I'm comfortable saying that these two are essentially the same. Remarkably so, because one could create all kinds of different stories about the origin of the universe, and these two match in so many remarkable ways. Now, as a scientist, I think that uh, one must recognize that nature is also a testament of God. If a scientist believes in God, then they should also believe that uh, God's message is written in everything in nature that God created. I mean, how else could it be? 
And science is therefore an effort to better understand that message and to better appreciate how uh, God intended uh, the universe to be. And this is, I will show you now, what I think is the oldest testament. This is called the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. Fancy name, CMB for short. And this is the oldest image of the universe that we will ever see. You can build a bigger telescope, you will never see an older picture of the universe. This is a picture of our universe when it was 36,000 times younger than it is today. In other words, it was about one-third of a million years old. This is before the first star, before the first galaxy, before the first planet. This is immediately after the moment that the universe stopped being a ball of fire. Now, what does it mean? There are a bunch of red dots, there are a bunch of blue dots. The red dots and the blue dots correspond to different temperatures of the universe, different densities of energy. But the universe was almost completely uniform. There was no structure in the universe at that time. It was just one big ball of fire with very little variation. The difference in temperature between the red dots and the blue dots, you see, is in the fifth decimal digit. To one part in 100,000, it was the same everywhere. The red dots eventually evolved over the billions of years to become clusters of galaxies. That's where most of the energy was. And the blue dots evolved to become vast voids of the universe. But at this point in time, there was almost no difference between them. Now, it doesn't look like this testament could tell you very much. It's just a bunch of dots. But just as people learn to understand the meaning of paintings, and uh, an art expert can tell you who the artist was just by looking at the brush strokes and the colors and the themes and so on. Scientists can learn to understand what this means. And what we do is a complicated mathematical procedure called the power spectrum analysis, but that's a fancy word for telling us how splotchy the dots are. So if we were to do a power spectrum analysis of an oil painting, we would be able to tell you what size brushes the artist used and how often he used each brush size. And if we do a power spectrum analysis on the cosmic microwave background radiation, this is what we get. And we can see the analogy. There are these size brushes used very often, these size brushes less often, and so on and so on. And the black dots are the observed data points. These are the points that represent the experimental measurements, and they are highly reliable. The uncertainties are so small that you can barely see the vertical lines here that represent the uncertainties. Here, the uncertainties are large, but over here, the uncertainties are minute. So this is extremely well-measured data, and those are the black dots that didn't measure data. And the red line is the prediction of the Big Bang Theory a nearly perfect match. So a cosmologist would say that anyone is entitled to come up with their own theory of the universe, but it has to match the experimental data, at least as well as the Big Bang Theory, before someone's going to take it seriously. That's an alternative. And that would be quite a substantial accomplishment, because this is a very superb match to a very complicated shape. And this match tells us a lot about the universe, an amazing amount, actually. It tells us how old the universe is. 13.75 billion years with an uncertainty of only 1%. It tells us how the energy of the universe is divided into the different components. 4.5% of the total energy of the universe is in the form of the normal atoms that we see, that we're made of, the normal atoms that stars are made of all the atoms on the periodic table, all, everything we can see in outer space, that's only 4.5% of what's out there. 400 years of quantitative science and we have nailed down 4.5% of reality. 95% is virtually completely un not understood. We think 22% is in the form of a, some type of matter, which we call dark matter, because it doesn't 
make any light. And nearly three quarters of the universe is in the form of dark energy. Something else that we really don't understand. So science still has a long, long way to go. Finally, let me talk about uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, new book, The Grand Design. Stephen Hawking is an outstanding scientist. He's made many great contributions to science and cosmology. Uh, I admire him greatly for many things, including his tenacity in staying alive with this heart disease that he's had for 60 years. But I very much dislike his current book. He says in his book that there is no grand design to the universe, that there is no fundamental truth for scientists or anyone else to search for, and there is no purpose to our existence. He says that all that we see around us is just random occurrence, just the result of random chance. Therefore, there's no truth to search for. He assumes that there are universes beyond our own that we can't see. And in fact, he assumes that there are an infinite number of these universes out there. And he assumes that if you have an infinite number of universes, they will have a variation in the uh, natural laws, the variation in the strength of gravity, the mass of the electron lots of other parameters so that you would have different phenomena in different universes. And so he says that everything that's possible must exist in one of these infinite universes because there's an infinite number. So he says that however extremely improbable are the existence of life, however extremely improbable is a universe that is precisely tuned to enable life as ours is, which he certainly agrees that these are true, he says, regardless of how improbable, they have to occur somewhere because there are an infinite number of universes, and therefore this is all just random occurrence. We happen to be the universe in which these things just happen to occur. And therefore he concludes, God is unnecessary. There is no need to invent God to answer any question because it's all random. That's what Stephen Hawking says. Okay, so my critique is that there is nothing in this new, in new book which represents new science. In fact, every idea that's in this book is at least 40 years old and has been espoused by other people. So it's a disappointment to a scientist to read a book by a great scientist that adds nothing to the field. Secondly, he makes uh, all of these assumptions without any scientific evidence to back up any of these. In fact, there is no evidence in science to either support or refute any of these assumptions. There is no evidence that there is a universe beyond the universe we see. There is no evidence that there could be an infinite number of them, although there's, they, they could exist. And there is no evidence that there are universes that contain every imaginable outcome. All of these are simply assumptions that many scientists make Stephen, but without any evidence, without any data to back that up whatsoever. And in fact, assuming that an infinite set of universes would include all conceivable possibilities is not a mathematical requirement. There are plenty of infinite sets that only include every conceivable possibility. An example of that is the prime numbers. There are an infinite number of prime numbers but there is only one that's divisible by two. So there are an infinite number of even integers that are not primes. There are also an infinite number of integers divisible by three that are not primes. So there are an infinite number of sets, of infinitely large sets, that are not included in the infinite set of primes. So infinity is a complicated thing, and just to say that an infinite set includes everything is mathematically unjustifiable. Finally, his logic is wrong. If, even if we accepted all of Stephen Hawking's unsupported assumptions, and again, there's no evidence that compels us to do so, but if we did ex accept all of Stephen Hawking's unsupported assumptions, then the conclusion would be that every conceivable possibility must exist somewhere, and therefore, 
his conclusion that God is unnecessary is backwards. Because if every conceivable possibility exists somewhere, then God must exist. God is a conceivable possibility, I think. Anyone here can agree with that? Right? Okay, so uh, if you believe his logic, then his conclusion is entirely imperfect. Right? And uh, maybe God doesn't exist in every universe, according to Stephen, but at least he must exist in one, and this might be. Okay, finally let me say that uh, Stephen is making a mistake that I find dreadful and made by many other scientists, uh, which I find very disturbing. And that is, his, he is stating his personal beliefs as if they were science, as if they had the endorsement and support of science. And that should never be done. So, He's entitled to his beliefs. His beliefs are no more valid and no less valid than anyone else's beliefs, but they shouldn't be portrayed as being scientifically based. And portraying them as science is a great disservice, in my view, to science, it's a great disservice to faith, and it's a great disservice to society as well. It does, however, result in higher book sales. So, that's my conclusion. I want to thank you all very much for listening. That was about 45 minutes. Very, very good. Thank you, Robert. Um, let me um, let's see what I can do here. Uh, we have uh, a few more people than usual. Um, should I put the lights up so that we can I think see? So. Do, you, do you want to use uh, anything more? I, I don't need it unless there's a question that you should go back. <laughs> okay. Um, we were going to uh, to be seated, but uh, I think that uh, we probably should, should remain standing so that we can uh, we can view. So what we uh, do in our class is, in order to be more democratic, is we. Uh, make a list of people who want to speak, and then we um, limit the number of uh, <coughs> time that uh, can be allotted to each speaker. And I think that, uh, class members, we need to modify things because uh, we have our, our different setting. And so uh, I suggest that we uh, continue to make a list, uh, but we, we let persons um, make a comment or a question uh, and have that done within 90 seconds, no more than a minute and a half, to say what you would like to say or, or ask the question. And then the presenter, Robert, uh, can go on for an unlimited amount of time. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> don't feel, don't, don't feel uh, constrained by that. Jim, do you want, let me do that, so. Jim, do you want me to keep time? Okay. Or, or What's not? That? Do you want me to keep time or not? Oh, I think so, Jan. Yes. Ninety seconds per 90 person. Seconds. Yeah. Okay, I get to yell out. That's right. Ninety and seconds. Jan is our timekeeper uh, because um, if you've been to our class before, we have a rather rambunctious group, and uh, we we've got to. These are not my rules. These are our rules. We we did this to ourselves. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, Doug. Doug uh, Capital will be the first, and then. Uh, then I will, uh, then Malin Kutsi. Okay, and then, uh, and then, then Tijo. Okay, and then Earth Shaman. And Ariel Close. Uh, welcome, Ariel. We haven't had you here in a long time. Uh, Okay, and then Nick, and then Max. And then, uh, ma'am, what is your name? Bonnie. Bonnie? Okay, and then, uh, okay, I think, uh, I think that's uh, enough for us uh, to, to get going, so, uh, Doug, please. Thanks for your comments this morning. They're 
stimulating. I, I'd like to assume in the comment that I'd like your reaction to that we, we assume that God has ontological properties if he exists. What I say from there is this. Either for reality to exist, it either came out of absolutely nothing or it always existed. Neither of those propositions makes any rational sense to me, but one of the two seems like it must be true. Uh, and again, I want to include God in, in, in the nature of reality. He's ontologically real, if, if he exists. How do you react to those two irrational propositions? Well, can I make the distinction between the universe and God? For a second, the physical universe. I mean, if God exists, then perhaps God has always existed. Perhaps. Of course, I don't know that. But that seems more logical. Uh, the universe, according to science, did not always exist. And in fact, the universe was created from absolutely nothing. And uh, that sounds very startling because we look around us and there's a tremendous amount of stuff. So where could all this stuff have come from, from nothing? But actually, the total sum energy of the entire universe is zero. If you take all the mass energy of all the stars and galaxies and planets, that's a big positive number. But the gravitational potential energy of all these objects and the gravitational field of all the other objects is a very large negative number. And if you add them together, the sum is zero. So in fact, one could create an entire universe from absolutely nothing. Now, I'm not saying that's easy to do. <laughs> but we have theories that are not completely irrational that explain how that might happen. There is not a lot of evidence, scientific data, that confirms those theories. When I showed you that testament of nature, the CMB, that's the best confirmation that the universe could have, in fact, come from absolutely nothing. But, but this it's completely consistent with this suggestion. But this, but this potential singularity, or whatever you want to call it. Yes, that's it, the right word, yes. It is not absolutely nothing, is it? Uh, it was before its existence absolutely nothing. Yes. They, um, there is this magic stuff called quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, there is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And one of the consequences of that is that nothing is not quite exactly nothing. It can be a little more nothing or a little less nothing. It can be a little plus and a little minus. And no one could ever clamp it down to say that it's absolutely zero, zero, zero. Okay? So it's fuzzy. And uh, it could be fuzzy, and one day it could be a little fuzzier this way. And if it happens to be fuzzy enough in the right way, it can evolve into a universe. The theorist who came up with this is named Alan Guth from Stanford at the time, now at MIT. And his conclusion was that the universe is the ultimate free lunch. You cannot believe that. It's not like a proven thing, right? It's not like the sum of the angles of a triangle. It's a not ridiculous idea. It has some experimental confirmation, and it's our best guess. But it shows us that the idea that the, this could come from nothing is not immediately dismissible as being crazy. Thank you. Just one follow up there. Do you, uh, going back to what you were saying about models, the models of science, the theories of science, um, when it comes to the border between scientific models and theories and religious ideas, is it black and white? Is there a bold line between, or is it more of a gradation, particularly when it comes to big issues like you and Doug were just talking about? Well, on the science side, it's gray. I mean, there is, a, there is a core set of ideas that are more or less carved in stone. 
I mean, they are really well established. It would be almost inconceivable that certain ideas of science are ultimately proven wrong, such as the conservation of energy. But then there is the peripheral stuff. And the peripheral stuff becomes grayer and grayer all the way out to, geez, it could be anything. Right? So from the scientific point of view, there is not a absolute black-white boundary. It's, it goes grayness. And I won't speak to the other side. You speak to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, uh, Malin. You can ask it much better, I'm sure. Speak um, loudly. Uh, you, you described I think quite uh, accurately the two worlds, here, the world of science and religion, I mean, the world of discipline and the world of religion and ideas and values. Maybe you could speak up a little bit so everybody can hear you. Uh, how do you see this relationship between these two areas working in the fact of the world of religion? Uh, one idea that's been uh, written and talked about is separate magisteria, where they're always kept separate, one can't really speak to the other, etc. Uh, do you subscribe to that, or do you describe a, a relationship you see to these two? Uh, they do disagree with each other on border areas, as you've already indicated, the AD universe, for example. Uh, how do you see the relationship between those two areas working uh, in the world? Let me tell you, did everybody hear the question? No. 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 I guess the, in, in briefly the question is how do I see the possibility of science and faith working together? Should they be completely separated and not talk to each other or should they work together? So I confess to being an unrelenting optimist. Some would call that naive. And it disturbs me greatly to see so much discord in our society. I'm unhappy when the Supreme Court votes five to four. I'm a little less unhappy if I'm on the five side, but I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy if the Senate votes 51 to 49. I would rather see it much more unanimous than that. And I am profoundly unhappy with the division between science and faith that is, seems to me, being promoted by certain groups on both sides for whatever reason. Now, I would like to find ways to get along, and I hope to be a small bridge in that effort. Uh, I love my brothers and my sister, and I disagree with many things that they believe. But we still sit down at Thanksgiving and have a reasonable time together. And so we don't need to all agree on everything, right? I mean, we all have our own brains for a reason and uh, an occasional disagreement is not bad at all. We just shouldn't shoot each other over it. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is uh, T. Joe, and T. Joe, would you start the, um, the practice of person standing and then asking their question uh, so that we can have people better heard? I would like to ask the question about 74% of the universe that you do not have much to say about called dark energy. And what will the new cyclotron in Geneva do in providing so-called God particle in understanding the source of dark energies? So since you were standing and you have a nice voice, I presume everybody question. Okay. Science is, uh, like everything else, a business that needs financial support. If you want the governments of the world to provide $10 billion to build an accelerator, you better have a good marketing plan. The so-called God particle is a marketing gimmick. There is nothing more godly about that particle than any other particle, or less godly. It just sells better. Now, that particle, the so-called Higgs boson, in more technical terms, is, the supposed to is supposed to explain the existence of mass. 
So it might explain the existence of dark matter, but it wouldn't explain the existence of dark energy. Dark energy is separate. Dark matter is, at this point, scientifically completely mysterious. I mean, I don't think there's a single cogent idea about what dark matter is. Although there are many ideas, there, I don't think it's a, it's a single one that's comprehensive and explanatory. There are about 80 experiments in the world ongoing today to try to catch a piece of this stuff and analyze. Dark energy, on the other hand, which is 74% of all the energy in the universe, I think we do have a handle on that. This is this mysterious substance that's pushing the universe apart at an ever-accelerating rate. We see evidence of that, and there is an explanation, again, from quantum mechanics and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that this is the energy of empty space. That because nothing can become something, while that nothing exists for an infinitesimal uh, period of time, it has a positive amount of energy. If so, it has to have a negative pressure, and Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that a substance of that type would have negative gravity. So all of that holds together, except we don't have a comprehensive theory that we can do the math with, and uh, our measurements aren't complete. So the evidence that we do have leads us to that conclusion, but it's not so. What do you think, Judge? Are you convinced? Well, I was hoping for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was too. <laughs> okay, uh, Taylor. Thank you very much for your presentation. You mentioned experimental data that supports the Big Bang model. I understand there are equally competent uh, physicists who are making comments to the effect that there may be some problems in the classical Big Bang model. What is, in your view, the biggest evidence that it seems to be right? And what is the best evidence that it doesn't seem to be right? What, are there two sides to that, or is there just one side? Uh, the original Big Bang model, which has been around since the 1920s, was uh, originally formulated by a Roman Catholic uh, monk, I believe, or maybe he was a priest, Georges Lemaitre from Brussels. It has, by the way, the endorsement of the Catholic Church. Uh, that model had certain mathematical difficulties which this gentleman, Alan Guth, that we talked about earlier, largely resolved by adding a little piece to the beginning of the Big Bang, which is called the era of inflation. And during the era of inflation, according to Alan Guth, the universe expanded at an incredibly rapid rate in a very short period of time. All of this took less than a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. But during that period, the universe grew by a factor that was even bigger than that number I just quoted. With that addition, the Big Bang Theory, and with the measurements of dark energy and dark matter, matches all known data. Again, we don't prove theorems are absolutely true, but if it matches all known data, that's as good as it gets. Uh, I know of no competent theory of cosmology, which is radically different than the Big Bang Theory. There have been many competitive theories over the years, the most famous being the steady state theory of Sir Fred Hoyle, who's a very charming person, very sharp sense of humor, all that, but his theory just didn't match the data. And however elegant and charming it was, if it didn't match the data, it's no good. Uh, Herb, do you have any follow-up? Uh, usually, we, we have we have a circle of ta tables, and we have more dialogue. So uh, I encourage people who do ask these questions to have follow-ups. Just, just, just quickly, my only my only personal knowledge here is at the level of Scientific American article, and uh, and I. When you said that, Herb, I'm sorry. And when you said that there are no com there is no complement to this. System. There, there are a few who have published queries in the last 10 years. Is that correct? 
those have been the overwhelming majority of the specialists in that area have said no, that doesn't make sense. To, to question that part of it. There are always queries. I mean, there, there probably have been 10,000 people who had a better idea about special relativity than Einstein. <coughs> they all went away because they didn't match the data and Einstein did. And it doesn't mean Einstein's going to be right tomorrow, but he's been right for 100 years. So, you know, if I had, if this was Vegas, I'd bet on Einstein. So, Scientific American publishes all, uh, lots of articles that are very speculative, and that's fine. Uh, theoretical physicists have the responsibility of coming up with every possible creative, wild, crazy notion, and experimental physicists have the responsibility of knocking them off one by one by measuring data and showing which ones don't match. So it's not, you know, that's a good thing. That's how we make progress, but. If you're not in the field, the best thing to do is to wait for that to settle a little bit before you pay too much attention to it, because most of what you do today isn't going to be around next week or next year. So I would say if, it, if an idea has withstood five years of challenge, then there's probably some value in it. And if it hasn't withstood five years of challenge, you know, I, would, I wouldn't hold my breath. Four weeks ago, there was a publication that uh, <coughs> physicists in Europe had measured neutrinos fa traveling faster than the speed of light. Two weeks ago, there was a letter published in the scientific journal showing how they forgot to measure a certain thing. <laughs> and the, he calculated what the correction would be, and then lo and behold, it happens to just match what Einstein would have said. Now, it's not settled because they're going to argue back and forth at a few more conferences and have fun about it. But, you know, this stuff happens all the time and uh, it's not really something to get overly excited about. Uh, Robert, in your, uh, your little book, Can't Life Be Merely an Accident, uh, I read a sentence at the end of your first chapter which makes me think that maybe you don't think that all theories are created equal. Uh, they're not, yes. <laughs> calling these pillars, referring to quantum mechanics uh, and I suppose special relativity, calling these pillars of science only theories, in quotes, uh, betrays a profound lack of understanding. A little hard, but yeah, <laughs> I said that, yeah. Well, okay, so what I mean is, what I showed you before, these things have been confirmed to 12 and 18 decimal digits. There are very few things in human existence that have been confirmed to that level of precision, right? So to call these just ideas, or just theories, in the English sense of the word theory, uh, doesn't uh, recognize the enormous degree of success that these ideas do have. Now, I'm not saying that quantum mechanics answers all questions like love, beauty, and the existence of God. It does, answers none of those. But if you want to know about the properties of an electron, quantum mechanics is you know, that's the right answer. Uh, okay, uh, Brian, did you have something right on this? Yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to, uh, at the chair's discretion, we will have some limited discussion because we do go in for another almost uh, another hour, so we'll be all uh, loose the bridge here. You know, further to this same question, uh, if in fact the uh, Higgs boson is confirmed, um, I was listening to a um, particle physicist lecture 10 days ago, and the uh, opinion expressed was that it would be confirmation of the standard model, but a great disappointment. Could you um, elaborate on exactly why, if it confirms the standard model, it would be a great disappointment? Something to do with gravity and quantum mechanics, I think. Well, let me get back to the fact that we had to raise $10 billion. I mean, not me, but they did, to build that accelerator. So how do you do that? You don't tell Congress, we're going to look to see if there's anything there. Give us $10 billion. That doesn't sell. <laughs> so we're looking for the God particle. We're looking for, you know, super symmetry. We're looking for blah, 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 blah. Well, so they put down all the things that we hope exist hope to find. If we find all those things, actually that's disappointing. 
if that's all we find. Because the main purpose in having a new big machine, a better microscope, is to see what you don't expect, to be surprised, to find something new, something that leads to a new and more advanced theory that gives us a deeper understanding of nature. If all we find at CERN, after spending $10 billion, is everything that we already expected, you know, yeah. and that really is a profound disappointment. And even more so because that's the first of those new machines in 40 years. So there are whole generations of scientists who have devoted their entire career <coughs> to making that thing work. And if all it shows is what everybody already knew, what way did they devote their life? Jim, how do I get on the list? Sorry. Okay. Uh, do you want on this one right here? Or do you want? Uh, no, it'll be the general. Okay. 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 I'll, I'll get you. Uh, okay. Uh, Ariel Rose, C could you uh, stand, please? Thank you. you mentioned that. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I really appreciate it. You mentioned that the Los Angeles Times had the science. Yes. I realize Los Angeles Times is not the fine sort, maybe, but it's very good, I think. Uh, the arts, and maybe arts, and you know, even though it has been studied for the nature, like 40% of the scientists believe in God in the answer to prayer. This is, they took a thousand names out of American men, women, science. It appears that there is a significant point in the scientific community that leads to God. Science is highly respected, very successful, and uh, has a great deal of energy. But as it's practiced now, you look at the scientific textbooks, you look at the scientific journals, very rarely is God mentioned or is it considered as a possible act of, act of nature. Yeah. Now, my, my question is along the line, when science was established, the modern science, like Galileo, Pascal, Boyle, Illuminati, uh, and others, and these folks all included God in their scientific writings. They were studying the laws that God had established. 92nd. Since 1850, and, uh, I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, exclusion of God. God has been rejected from science. It's not there. It's not allowed. If you put him in, you're fired from your position. My question to you is, does science need to redefine itself uh, either as atheistic or do you need to allow the possibility of God to be excluded? Well, I, I hate to be the authority on how science should be run. Uh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I get my one vote for today, right? Yeah. I don't think scientists should be preaching religion. Uh, first of all, there's lots of different religions. Which one are they going to support? Uh, if you ask, talking about the polls, if you ask a scientific group if they believe in God, the percentage that will say yes will depend very much on whether you ask them individually in private or you ask them in a group like this to raise their hands. They will be reluctant to raise their hands. I think scientists, I mean, this is what I feel as a scientist. Scientists ought to do what they do well and avoid doing things we're not qualified to do. And I'm not qualified uh, to be a theologian. And I certainly don't feel entitled to tell you what you should believe. My political beliefs, my religious beliefs, my ethical beliefs are very important to me. But I don't have any need to make you share those beliefs. So 
I don't see why I should be telling you what you should believe uh, in, in any field other than science. In science, I have expertise, and I'd like to share with you things that I feel are well-accepted scientific uh, discoveries. Not my own crazy wild ideas necessarily, but what I think is well-established science, because that's a contribution that I feel comfortable with making. And if I tie that into religion, then, uh, I mean, what if I was a Muslim, right? And I had a new theory of the Big Bang and I attributed it to Allah. Well, a lot of people aren't Muslims, and so what would they think about my theory of the Big Bang? I mean, they tie it into the religious side that I linked it with. So, I don't think it's a successful endeavor to tie science to religion. I don't think it should be against religion, but I don't think it should be endorsing any particular religion uh, either. So, I think that, uh, like, I mean, art is not necessarily tied to faith. <coughs> there are artists who do works that promote certain uh, faiths, and there are plenty of artists who do works that are completely secular. So I think that's a relationship that largely works. There are people who offend us, but that's their right of free speech. <coughs> I think science ought to work similarly. It ought to be largely independent of other fields like art, literature, and faith. Do you think, do you think we should put truth above science? Science is worthless if it isn't about truth. The only purpose truth. of science is to look for truth. But if it restricts God out of the picture, can it ever find God as long as it doesn't allow God to explain it for a minute? Well, as, as I said in my presentation, I don't think science is capable of addressing certain important questions like whether or not God exists, you know, what's beautiful, what are ethical principles. Those are all important questions, but that's not something that science is the right tool to talk about, right? So if you're, if you're laying bricks, you don't use a saw. You don't use, a, you don't use a, a nail if you're laying bricks. Science is a nail, right? You want to connect boards, use the nail. You want to lay bricks, you've got mortar. Uh, John, I'll get you in just a second. In our class here, we have, uh, over the years, made a distinction between this fancy word uh, methodological naturalism and ontological naturalism, suggesting that science has naturalistic methods, but it's, they are merely methods that work. And when it comes to the being of the universe, uh, that's another realm, the realm of religion or philosophy that talks about what being is, whether it's naturalistic or something other. And it seems like Dr. Roth is pushing you to, uh, to want to, uh, to put God in the equation that uh, science has that is basically naturalistic in its approach. And, uh, and you're wanting to say, well, Maybe there is God, but it's beyond the competence of science because science is methodologically naturalistic. So, so, so I don't think he's saying there isn't a God. He's just saying that's beyond the uh, what the pay scale of scientists. They're not uh, they're, they're not engaged in, uh, in in those lofty activities. Uh, John, you were going to. Does he does uh, do you agree with what I just said? <laughs> Beyond my pay scale. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that science is good at certain things, and that's what scientists should do. I mean, I'm an experimental physicist. I believe in data. I believe in uh, learning things by measuring and analyzing data, and I have a certain skill set in doing that. You know, I'm not comfortable painting oil paintings, and I'm not comfortable singing. I mean, you know, I would kill all of you in a minute if I tried to sing. So I learned over the years to do what I do well and avoid things that would offend everybody else. So, yes, uh, I'm about measurements and numbers and what we can learn from that. And uh, I 
recognize that there are plenty of things that are of value to humanity that are not included in that list of tasks, which are beyond my paper. <laughs> so, uh, John, you want to follow up on this? Or did you want to get us to some new uh, area to bring up? I have one minute on this. Uh, okay, Barbara. Uh, you made a couple statements that I don't live with ambiguity real well. And uh, one is scientists are not collegial. And then you said 50% of scientists. Well, what do you label as a scientist? Uh, the National Academy of Science, if you say all scientists, you know, the major scientists, that's only about 5 to 10% believe in God in the National Academy of Science. And then uh, you use a quote from, uh, from Einstein several quotes from him. As I follow his life, he said certain things through cer certain periods of his life. And near the end of his life, he wasn't a real big believer in God. And so it depends on where you capture him. And it appears to me a lot of times we use what scientists do to our favor. Uh, we'll say, well, Einstein believed this, or Galileo believed this, or Newton believed this. But if you follow Newton even, he, be, he became very uh, apocalyptic in his belief system. He, he kind of got away from science. He got very strong into religion. He kind of a weird kind of religion. So we oftentimes, as presenters, uh, present what we want to present of somebody. But if we take the totality of that person, we either demonize them or we make them angelic according to where we want to put them. And I read books. They, they demonized Why? Darwin. And I said they said he wasn't a scientist. Can I get a one minute oh, wow. in here? <laughs> I know. I know a lot about his life, and I know that he was a great scientist. He spent eight years studying uh, barnacles. I mean, just so that's my language. Well, I, I think the question is: Were you being scientific in your selection of quotes from Einstein? <laughs> Well, there's no doubt that Einstein made many comments in his life. I mean, he's one of the most quoted people that ever existed, and not all of his comments are consistent. But I, I heard uh, a report, I read a report that on his deathbed, he had a conversation with his nurse, and they talked about God. And uh, he said to her that the purpose of his life was to explore this great garden the universe and to get better understand the work of God. And she said, do you think that God is the gardener? And Einstein said he thought God was the gardener. That's on his deathbed. So that was the last thing. Um, I just have a comment. Are you on this, this I'm on this here? topic. Okay, what, what's your name? Kathleen Dunn. Okay, Kathleen. And that was a beautiful segue into what Stand I want to up. say. Okay, I have a loud voice, so I think you'll probably not miss what I have to say. It seems to me that Einstein was dealing with the world as sort of a whole. And I would like to see religion more informed by science. So science tells us certain realities about our world. And it seems that those, rather than the other way around, that somehow Science should be informed by religious ideas, which we all know are many, and based on books that are 2,000 or more years old, or very old. I would like to see our religion, our views of God, our understanding of whatever divinity or mystery there is in this world, informed by science, so that we look at the world much more as a whole rather than, than a dichotomy. Uh, yeah, that's more of more of a, a statement or a I'm plea. I'm sorry, it was a statement. It was yeah. a plea. It was a help right. out. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, as a, a, a religious thinker, I would totally agree with you. I mean, yeah. if religion has to do with the meaning of life, how do you know how to give something meaning if you don't first study life? Um, it's, not, uh, it's not apples and oranges, it's uh, the meaning of apples and the meaning of oranges that religion adds. Fruitful discussion. We couldn't hear back here. Uh, Dave said, 
Was, was God the garden or the gardener? We couldn't hear. The, the nurse asked Einstein, was God, do you believe God is the gardener? Yes. And Einstein answered that he believed God was the garden. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. <laughs> okay. Well, did you on this right here? Yes. Yeah. Still, uh, nevertheless. You, you mentioned that scientists, if I, if I can pull this together properly, that scientists collect the data. And they make their decisions based on the data. I don't know very many scientists, but I'm of the. I think there are times when scientists collect the data, and the data is there, and they say, "That can't be right," and so they will take that data and put it on the shelf until they are convinced that the data is right, or until it is proven. Is there ever a time when data is collected and? Well, that can't be right, but we don't understand it fully, and so they put it on the shelf. And my question is, if that is the case, is that decision a scientific decision, or is that kind of an ontological decision? Well, it's, it's the duty of, first of all, not every scientist is, uh, acts appropriately all the time, just like every other group. <coughs> No, we're not all perfect. <clears throat> but it's the duty of a scientist uh, who's, who's an experimentalist, who's a measuring person, to do as good a job as possible in making the measurements, to make all of the checks that are necessary to confirm that his data is indeed correct, and publish the data. <clears throat> it's okay to publish data and say, I don't know what this means. That's fine, but the world community should know what the data was. And the data should be as transparent as possible, both in terms of how it was collected, how precise it is, and what the concerns are. I mean, uh, if you think your instrument may have a certain uh, flaw, but you're not sure, then that should be highlighted in the report. Um, I'm sure there are cases where people have measured things that they were startled at the answer, and they sat on them for <coughs> longer than they would have if they weren't startled by the answer. That's fine. Um, you should double check, and if, you're, if it's a very surprising result, maybe triple check. I've heard of cases in which that's happened, but in all the cases I've heard of, that data was ultimately published, and you know, in a reasonable, timely fashion. Uh, there may well have been cases in which the data wasn't published. If they didn't, if they were ashamed of their data, then they probably didn't want anyone to know about it. So that's why I don't know about it. But that's not proper scientific procedure. The procedure is you publish data regardless of what it is, but you also have to make the effort to ensure that that data is as high quality as, as possible. Did I answer your question? I'm understanding your question to be that regardless of the results of the data, it should be published. Yes, of course. It's not, us, it's not for us to decide what's true. That's already been decided best we can hope to do is to find out what that truth is. Okay, uh, Nick. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I'm impressed with your presentation. And I want to thank you, Jim, for inviting Dr. Tizioni uh, to talk to us. I'm impressed for one reason, especially because I've heard centered things I never heard before. And uh, I have two questions. One is, which one of your books contains most of the things you said today to us so I don't have to spend a fortune in buying <laughs> everything? <laughs> my, my second question is, what do you think? What do you think about the Christian school and more especially, Adventist school or Adventist theologians suggesting that we should use something similar to the methodological naturally in studying the Bible and teaching the Bible. You know, 
louder, please. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm explaining the question. I'm explaining the question. Well, to say it out loud. I'm saying, uh, I believe the intent of the question is just as scientists don't depend on miracles when it comes to interpreting, to doing their experiments or interpreting the data, yeah. he's saying, should those who study religion use a similar methodology? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That, that's what he's saying. <laughs> I'm going to answer the question about the price of my book. <laughs> okay, this, this book contains a lot, it's a bigger book, it's full of a lot of color pictures, and it covers all of modern physics, astronomy, and cosmology. Really everything in those fields that's well established. Science. And, uh, this is thirty dollars. The title is. It. We can't it see the not, title. It does not. It's called Everyone's Guide to Adam, Einstein, and the Universe. <coughs> and uh, let me immodestly say that this is the highest-rated science book in its field on Amazon.com. Substantially higher rated than any book by Brian Greene, Stephen Hawking, Michio Kaku, or even Richard Feynman. <laughs> The reason is you can actually read this book. <laughs> this book is about the origin of life, and uh, very little of this is contained in this because I thought of these ideas afterwards. This is a much smaller book, so it says much less, it's much more focused. And the good news is you don't have to choose. <laughs> My chief financial officer over here will make you a uh, wonderful bargain on the pair. <laughs> and the pair come in this beautiful designer case, <laughs> which complements any attire <laughs> and has a handle. <laughs> and I want everybody to know that uh, Robert and Nick did not collude on this before the meeting started. <laughs>